Welcome, everyone. My name is Pratesh here with Kaizen Crypto. Thank you all so much for joining. I hope you are doing well. In this interview, I had the opportunity to speak with Ken Alling. He's the chairman of the Meld Project. There's been quite a few questions and even a little bit of controversy around the Meld Project. And hopefully in this video, I do a good job of being able to address some of those questions for you related to the Meld Project. We went through and talked about some of the things related to their initial stake pool offering, their token sale, the MELD protocol, their team behind the project, a whole bunch of different things. Hopefully it's able to provide some value to you. If you do enjoy this type of content, please be sure to drop a like and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I did just want to say thank you also to all of our viewers and our subscribers, all of our delegators to our stake pool for everybody who did support and helping me come up with these lists of questions. You guys really do mean the world to me. I appreciate each and every one of you. If you guys do enjoy this content and if you want to support our work, please consider delegating to Kaizen Stake Pools. It really does mean the world to me. All right, everyone. So thank you again. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Welcome, everybody. Uh, today, I'm joined by Ken Alling. He is the chairman of the MELD Project. So Ken, thanks so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm doing good, Pratesh. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really looking forward to having this conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a lot of questions related to the MELD Project from the Cardano community. So hoping mm -hmm. that we can get a chance to address those in our conversation. So I guess to start things off, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and um, sure. how long have you been involved in the blockchain space? So um, my sort of previous career was in design. So I worked as a designer for some 25 years and then I stopped doing that in 2011 and I started moving into technology. So in around 2017, I started working as a consultant uh, during the sort of ICO period. And I did that for maybe year, year and a half, and then things died down. And then I sort of came back into it in 2020. Um, but I've been working in technology, sort of skirting uh, blockchain technology in the other types of technology that I've worked in, which is large scale data ingestion and processing using semantic technologies. Um, and so in 2020, when DeFi kind of demonstrated a different model when it sort of the AMMs came into play and you started to see different types of bonding curves and these kinds of things that sort of piqued my interest again uh, because I saw a much clearer more straightforward approach to the technology the ICO stuff was very kind of floaty and you know you were trying to sort of explain a narrative explain a story and it's got a tokenized component to it when DeFi came into play, it was like, we're doing financial instruments, we're using financial services, and there are fees connected to them. So it's a very, it's something you can explain to anybody, you don't have to spend 20 minutes trying to explain how you're going to use the blockchain to sell apartments better or something. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. So I guess that kind of ties into my next question. So then as far as your involvement in the blockchain space, so I guess you saw what happened in 2017 with the ICOs and, yep. and whatnot, and how that relates to uh, bringing about financial services for people who wanted to use the ICO to build protocols mm -hmm. around blockchain technology. Uh, so I guess that kind of leads us to MELD. And um, could you explain like what is MELD and uh, the mission behind the project? So <clears throat> the, the basic background comes from sort of direct experience with a lot of my friends. Um, I saw sort of 2018, 2019, I had a lot of friends here um, from many different countries that started investing in crypto heavily. Um, then sort of 2019 comes, 2020 comes, we get the DeFi summer. And most of these friends of mine, their portfolios swelled. And as they swelled, they invested more and they didn't want to spend any of their money on anything except for crypto. And I would, I would go out and have lunch with a friend um, and I would buy him lunch, but his portfolio is worth, you know, millions and millions and millions, <laughs> but he doesn't have any money. And so as I was sort of developing these ideas, it sort of struck me that this ability to maintain your long position and be able to live your life was a really important component. And of course you have BlockFi and Nexo and Celsius and these guys, great. 
Uh, but these are centralized. These are black boxed. These are very America centric. And what I kind of bought into when I was started sort of engaging in crypto again was, you know, composability, money Legos, bankless, um, De, you know, decentralized, trustless, non-custodial, and all this kind of stuff. This made sense to me. But this idea of an in, uh, sort of institutional backing for a crypto lending platform that's black boxed and does rehypothecation and other things in the background that you have no idea what's happening, that didn't make a lot of sense. And on top of that, a lot of my friends, even if they wanted to, they wouldn't pass the KYC because they don't fall into this very narrow box. If you're, for example, an American living abroad, you can just forget about it. You fall into this gray area and you just don't get any assistance on either side of the fence. And so I thought that it was an underserved environment. It was an underserved product. And so when I started talking to people about it and sort of fielding this idea, then it really kind of resonated with a lot of people. It really made a lot more, it, it had more impact than I had ever expected it was going to have when I talked to people about it. Because it affects everybody, you know, it affects every single person that holds crypto. If you have, you know, the Cardano blockchain has great capital efficiency. Capital efficiency is what you need. Right now, ETH does not have great capital efficiency. You have massively high gas prices. You have sort of long block writing times. You have all, all these kinds of issues that will be addressed in the next you know, year or two. But right now, they don't have capital efficiency. And yes, it's great if you, if you go to Comp or you go to Aave and you can sort of lock up your capital and you know, it's going to cost you $50 or $80 to make a transaction if you have three or $400,000. But if, let's say, you're in Africa or you're in South America and you have $80 or $100, then the idea of having a transaction costing you $50 is a non-starter. And so it made sense to go into this space, uh, go into Cardano and start to look at how, how you could actually use this aspect of tying up this asset and then borrowing against it, basically debt financing. Large corporations use debt fin financing all the time. Normal people don't really have the opportunity to use debt financing. And this ability to provide this instrument to people that make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and people that make hundreds of dollars a month because you have, have capital efficiency, I think is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you make a, a lot of good points there because I mean, it's a non-starter for somebody who has just a few hundred dollars. They want to borrow capital, but then just to transact on the network, it's going to cost them a large majority of the available capital just to make those transactions. So it does make sense to see, you know, the opportunities there with Cardano are definitely there in terms of, you know, how efficient it would be to create something like a lending platform or, or what have you, anything really that would allow for uh, multiple transactions to occur without really a high cost. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess as far as, you know, what you guys are trying to do. So now as far as lending, borrowing, all these types of things that we saw with DeFi. So, mm -hmm. I mean, Cardano, it definitely makes a lot of sense for that to happen. Now, is this meld protocol is it going to be something that's geared towards uh, like p2p like is it going to be a decentralized in that aspect or like um, i did read in the white paper that you guys are also looking at banking infrastructure i guess uh so like what's the tie in there like how does that all kind of tie into DeFi? yeah so so you we're drawing upon a lot of things that exist already right we're drawing upon the comps and aves and liquidity and these are brilliant projects we know some of these people in the space it's fantastic what we're trying to do is we're trying to cross the bridge we're trying to cross the bridge from crypto to fiat so we want to be able to make it possible for people to take out lock up their crypto and get fiat for that and so this is really where the the banking protocol protocol component comes into play so the protocol itself, it will be open sourced. It will be held by a Swiss foundation. So it won't be held by any particular individual. And there will be two oracles related to it. The first oracle is a security oracle. And the second oracle is the bank oracle. And the bank oracle essentially is a open banking API that brings all non-blockchain, all of the sort of bank events 
onto the blockchain. So it's not just simply a deposit and a withdrawal and a balance or anything like that. You have lots of other transactions that you get validated when you're dealing with an open banking API. You have like transaction verification, you have custodial accounts on the other end, you have all kinds of error codes when you know wire transfers get sent back. And there's a whole laundry list of different events that need to get captured onto the blockchain. So in this way, it's very much like trying to bring an equity onto the blockchain or something like that. It's just, we're focusing on a, a much more narrow area. It's just a series of bank accounts by the different participating banks that allows that liquidity to come in and go out to people that are borrowing against it. So, it's not, a, it, so it's not a peer-to-peer -peer lending. Um, we looked at peer-to-peer, -peer, but it just felt very, um, what would you call it? It felt very constricting. You know, it's, it's like, you know, the AMM solved this with, when it comes to normal lending, you have the order book component. If you have someone on one side who wants to, you know, provide liquidity for $100,000, but there's a million, there's someone who wants to borrow a million dollars, then you don't have a match. And so that peer to peer mechanic didn't make a lot of sense. So we wanted to follow much more of the AMM and DeFi model and build a protocol that operates itself that allows you to have a liquidity pool that then provides the sort of benefits to the liquidity provider and provides the fiat loans to sort of the people that are borrowing money. Okay, so help me understand a little bit when you say liquidity pool. Hmm. So as far as available capital that would give access uh, to money or for these banks, um, like how, how does that look? Is the liquidity pool going to be something decentralized that contains ADA? Is it going to be fiat? Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's two sides to it. And so we have a kind of a, a Chinese wall in the middle. So on the banking side, you have bank accounts, which are controlled by the foundation. And these bank accounts essentially are different banks or sort of liquidity providers that have bank account systems that can connect to the protocol. And so when you set up these bank accounts, then various different liquidity providers provide capital, they provide fiat into these liquidity pools on the fiat side. And so when someone borrows against their crypto, then that liquidity on the fiat side is then sent to that person. It never crosses over. We don't have on-ramping and off-ramping and all this kind of fancy stuff. On the crypto side, you have the crypto that you've collected, you know, whatever ETH, BTC, ADA, etc. You lock it up into a smart contract. And then once it's locked up into a smart contract, that's executed. And then the blockchain can then go to the bank Oracle and send the message to the bank API saying, send this money to this person, send the documentation relevant to that, etc. Okay. Okay. So there is going to be some aspect of decentralized applications in this, I guess, with things like uh, liquidation events, interest rates, borrow limits. Okay. Okay. And then you're also combining that with the Oracle solution as well for like live data, price feeds, et cetera. Correct. Correct. And okay. you sort of market movement, uh, you know, market velocity, all these kinds of things that you have to bring into a, a, a risk model that you're going to, that's going to run the protocol. Okay. Okay. I gotcha. Yeah. Now, I guess as far as building something like this, you know, developing this type of protocol, uh, could you tell us a little bit about the relevant experience of the team? Um, I guess, as far as the developers that are involved, mm -hmm. uh, do you guys have any participation within the Plutus Pioneers program? Mm -hmm. uh, any type of relevant experience there? Yeah. So my co-founder, hi, he's been working on the Cardano blockchain for the past three years. Uh, he, we have a team of eight people now. Five of them have been working with him on the, the blockchain for the past three years as well. Uh, I think we have five or six people that have been part of the Plutus Pioneer in the first version of it. Um, Hai works very closely with lots of people in the community. He worked on the Indigo protocol. He's worked on four or five different projects and protocols, both in regards to Cardano as well as other blockchains. So the only reason I was willing to pull the trigger on this project was because of Hai. He has the skill. He has the pedigree, he has the background, he has the mentality, he has the sort of the, the, the approach necessary for attacking something like this, because this is a very, uh, this is a very 
monumental task that we're taking on here. This is not some, you know, it's not a sort of simple, okay, we're going to wrap something. Yay. No, this is actually a big deal and it requires the right kind of person and the right kind of mindset. And so far, High has just turned out to be absolutely amazing. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. You know, just keeping up with all these projects. I know it's amazing. I know the Plutus Pioneers program, they're turning out some experienced developers, I'm sure very soon that are going to build some cool things on Cardano. So that's well, it's uh, tough, right? You know, it's, you're, you're, <laughs> you're looking for a Haskell developer, yeah. which is just that just as a Haskell developer, it's a needle in a haystack, you know, yeah. and then you're looking for a Haskell developer that knows something about crypto. And then you're looking for a Haskell developer that knows something about crypto that's interested in working with you. And then you need a whole bunch of them. <laughs> right. So, right. So this was, it was purely, you know, when it sort of, it fell into my lap. I mean, hi and I, we've been speaking for many, many months before we started this, but you know, just the fact that he has so many developers that are working on this, that they're all super fired up about this. I mean, that's the only reason why we even have any chance of actually pulling this off. If we just had, for example, one developer, it was just high, then it wouldn't, you know, the, the, the amount of time it would take to get going on this would be super, super difficult. And so it, that sort of has been a key component and a key reason for us to be so aggressive in the market and really sort of try and make this happen and make it happen quickly. Okay. Okay. Very cool. So now I wanted to uh, shift gears just a little bit. So sure. uh, I'm sure you're uh, well aware of the bit of controversy that's been going on within the Cardano Lots. community. Yeah, I mean, there's just a, there's quite a bit of eyebrows being raised. So I guess, you know, we're going to go through those tough questions here, you know, just hoping to lay it out on the table and just to get some answers regarding that. But Absolutely. as far as as far as your initial stake pool offering, so, mm -hmm. you know, this is a really uh, new model. It's very uh, revolutionary. And I think that you're among one of the first projects within the Cardano yeah. ecosystem to do something like this. The craziest to actually do it. It's uh, it's pretty incredible to think about, but um, I guess, could you tell us a little bit more details regarding your initial stake pool offering and I guess, uh, how many total pools are there and what are the percent margins being charged by each pool? So we have nine pools. Eight of them are set to 99%. One of them is set to 50-50. So the, the background for the ISPO was that I was actually listening to Cardano Live and I was listening to the controversy around the Occam uh, ICO. And now the community was really super upset and really angry about the fact that they didn't get any of the tokens and they were all bought by robots in 30 seconds. And it's, you know, why is it on Ethereum? It's not very sort of friendly to Cardano, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think that there's any, there was any malice on, on Occam's side at all. I think it was just a sort of reaction of the, of the community, but it got me thinking that night, how can we make a more fair way for people to get a hold of tokens because the way that the system is set up today it is not fair so there's lots of regulations around being able to do a token subscription or a token sale that omits the ability for normal people to get access to them especially well just it, there's just it's very very limiting and then it sort of hit me wow we can use stake pools we can keep the block rewards and in exchange for the block rewards, we can do an airdrop of tokens. And I was super excited about this. I was just over the moon. And so then I called high that night, I woke him up and I was like, this is what we can do because this gives access to everybody. This is what flattens out the playing field. And then his response was, yeah, yeah, people in Cardano have been talking about it for, I don't know, three or four months. <laughs> so it sort of deflated me a little bit, but then when we started looking into it seriously, we started trying to reach out to stake pool operators with not any success. And then we decided we were going to run the ISPO all our own. Um, and we spun up a couple of, I think we spun up one or two, I think we spun up two stake pools um, just to sort of get things moving. Um, and then we had a run up, I think for about a week or two before July 1st, where we started doing marketing around it. And then we launched it. Um, with no understanding of sort of what the reaction would be. So we, we, we had no idea. We talked to Cardano Foundation about it. We talked to a couple of other different sort of players in the market. 
And they all thought it was a really, really good idea, but we had no idea what the response would be. And so on the day that we had the launch, the ISPO, um, I was sitting down in Photoshop and I was like Photoshopping up these little graphics saying, you know, 1 million ADA staked, 1.5 million ADA staked, 2 million ADA staked, 2.5. And then I just got a message from, from Stuart, who's our social media guy saying, you don't need any of this. We're already at, I don't know what we were at. We were at like a hundred million or something. Yeah. It was pretty mind blowing. Yeah. Right. And so that was the, the goal. The goal was to even the playing field, flatten it out, make it so that normal people can get access to this kind of stuff in a legal and fair way. So we didn't start it before we had, I think we did about four weeks of due diligence with our law firm in Singapore. And when they came back and they said, here is the legal document that says, you know, the, in, of, in, based on our opinion, this is a fully legal um, thing to do. And it was like full steam ahead. And so it went really well for like two days, three days. And then the uh, stake pool operators started coming out of the woodwork. And so that's when what we're sort of leading to now in this conversation is all of the sort of frustration and anger, which I completely get um, from the stake pool operators because they're seeing all of their delegations being drained out and being brought over to the MELD ISPO. So... I don't have any kind of response to it in regards to, you know, was this, was there any sort of ill intent on us to sort of like come after stake? Definitely not. I mean, we reached out to you, we reached out to lots of stake pool operator, operators and they didn't, they just didn't respond to us. So, I mean, uh, granted we were nobody, we were nothing, right? We had just sort of, you know, we'd been working for a year in the background. We hadn't sort of done anything yet. And so then the, the, then, you know, some of the stake pool operators. We've talked to lots of stake pool operators now. A lot of them are very level-headed. They understand the situation. They don't hold a grudge. They don't. They don't like it. Definitely, I wouldn't like it either. Uh, but they're not sort of. There's nothing beyond that. Um, and then when there's a handful of stake pool operators that are very, very aggressive and very upset about the situation, um, and that are sort of coming at us from whatever angle they can manage to grab. Yeah, quite a bit of mixed feelings there. Mm. Um, and, you know, I can definitely empathize with the stake pool operators. I can as well. So, absolutely. Yeah. I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not sort of belittling their situation. Not at all. So, um, again, I, we've had, we're having lots of conversations with stake pool operators about this, um, sort of trying to explain our position both in the short term as well as in the long term. Um, in the short term, there's not much that I can do about it. Um, I'm sorry that this is the situation. Uh, we get a lot of projects coming to us asking us how to do an ISPO. And we're trying to put sort of our learnings together in regards to, you know, what we did right, what we did wrong, what to think about, where there are gotchas, all this kind of stuff. And some of that sort of information we're trying to include state pool operators in the dialogue to figure out a better way of approaching it than having just us create our own state pools i mean we did it because we had no choice so that's what we did once our state pools once the ispo is over with we'll shut down i think we're planning on shutting down all of our state pools except for one um and then going back to sort of normal operations so this isn't a kind of forever thing this is a one-time thing that's the function of it it's there to have the community be able to participate in the initial development of meld and be rewarded for their sort of voting with their ada towards the project and then shut it down and then move on and start sort of building and launching and developing and all that kind of stuff so i can't really do or yeah, I can't really do much about, about the, the, the frustration or the anger. The only thing we can really do is offer explanations, communication, talk to people, you know, try and be as, as sincere and as, as kind of logical and level-headed as we can. Um, the rest of it, we can't really do much about. 
I see. I see. Okay. So now, you know, talking about the pools a little bit. So you had mentioned that you had started with a couple just to see how it went. And then you went up to nine. Yeah. So, you know, as far as the amount of capital that you've managed to accumulate at this point in terms of delegation, so roughly 200 million ADA approximately delegated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, as far as the rewards for that, so the pools are charging a hundred percent margin is essentially, Mm -hmm. I guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ken. So like, as far as how it works, so a delegator can choose to delegate to a meld stake pool and in exchange, they're going to receive meld tokens uh, as a way to be able to participate uh, within the protocol. Yeah. Um, so now, as far as you had mentioned that this is going to be the initial point of like raising capital, mm. you know, bringing in approximately, I think a little bit more than 500,000 ADA rewards per month. Um, you know, that's, that's quite a bit of capital. So, I mean, as, as far as what you guys plan on doing with the amount of Mm -hmm. money raised, uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? And then I guess, as far as how many months will these pools operate as well? So the, the pools are operating for 32 epoch. Um, so it's going from July 1st to, uh, to December 8th. Um, the, the way that the meld tokens are calculated for the person who is staking puts all of the risk on our shoulders. So the calculations of the meld tokens you get are not based on the block rewards that we get. They're based on the amount of ADA that you have staked and the time that you have staked it. So it is our risk that we take on in regards to be able to turn, make that um, delegation actually make those block rewards. And as you know, because you're a stake pool operator, it takes two epoch to warm up a stake pool, right? So you can kill two epoch right away. You're not going to get anything for that. And then there's a kind of build up in regards to that versus for, uh, of sort of active active stake versus uh, pledge or, or not active stake versus I forget what it's called. But so there's two stages, right? Um, if you delegate before the epoch has started and you have the snapshot, then that doesn't count. And so we're not getting 32 we're getting much less than 32. And because the amount of delegation that is being delegated is slowly increasing, it's not like we're getting 230, 230 million from day one, boom, off we go. That's not the way that it's working. So we're looking at if we're really, really lucky, we'll get 10 million ADA. And so the question that the community is asking, why do you need 10 million ADA? I mean, really, that's an enormous amount of money. And that is not the case. (laughs) So all you have to do is just, you know, look next door to any other project that is related to this kind of technology. What was it? Nexo, 52 million. Kyber Network, 48 million. Bank X, 70 million. Ave Ray, 17 million. You know, we're building oracles, we're building lending and borrowing protocol, we're doing a bridge onto fiat. You know, just think about legal in Singapore, legal in Switzerland, legal in Singapore and Switzerland in blockchain. You know, all of these things cost a lot of money. When you go into the blockchain space, it is not cheap. You know, I, I was watching one of your last uh, interviews and the, the guy was saying, you know, crypto developers, <laughs> they're not cheap. And so we're not raising an enormous amount of money. We're raising the money that we need to be able to deliver on the product. What would be much worse is if we sort of over optimistically said, OK, we can do this maybe on two million and then all of a sudden get caught with something that you, you know, unexpected situation or a bank takes longer to go through their API process and you end up running out of money and you can't do anything or you have to go out and you then have to do an IDEO or you have to do something else. So we're trying to be as responsible as we can when it comes to this kind of a thing. And so the, 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 the use of proceeds, all you have to do is look at other projects that are have even a close relate. I mean, just like was the synthetics, just the just the wrapping of assets. Synthetics, I think they raised around twenty million. So we're not raising an enormous amount of money. Um, this is what the space is, and this is how the space works. And if you're raising, if if you if you're expecting to raise a lot less money than that, and you're trying to work in this kind of a space, then you're running the risk of not being able to deliver. 
Okay. Okay. So now that I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, legislation, because you had mentioned yeah. legal in Switzerland, legal in Singapore. Uh, before I do uh, get into that, though, if we could just touch on a little bit of the token itself. I mean, like sure. as far as the utility, uh, are you guys actually, in addition to the ISPO, actually offering a token sale? Yes. Uh, I guess, like what's going on there with the token? So we're offering a token private sale. Um, I can't go into the details. The reason why we're offering a token private sale is because we had no idea how the ISPO was going to go. So we needed to be able to have that. What I can say is that if the ISPO goes really well, then we take 200 million tokens from the private sale and we put it into the token sale because this is, this is the kind of mechanic that we want to, we want to support. We want to support community development over private investment. Are we unrealistic and sort of, or so are we already sort of optimistic and believing that, you know, just relying on this first time, never been done before ISPO is going to cover all of our expenses. We have no idea. Like I said, when, you know, on day one, I was sitting down in Photoshop doing 1.5 million, 2 million. And, you know, I mean, I literally, there was a, on day one at like one o'clock in the morning, somebody delegated 31 million ADA and I fell off my chair. Literally, I fell off my chair. I wasn't, you know, we're in uncharted territory. Um, so I don't have kind of answers as to how this is going to go or how it's going to play out. The only tools that we have is to be honest, to be able to talk about it, to talk to the community about it, to try and write down a lot of our sort of learnings and then pass that on when the ISPO is over with saying, you know, these are the great things that happened. You know, these are some of the gotchas, you know, look out for this, do this, don't do this. And then sort of make it, you know, allow other people to not make the same mistakes we made. They'll make new mistakes. Okay. Okay. So in addition to the ISPO, you got the token sale. Now, as far as the legality and the legislation, mm -hmm. so this is available to U.S. residents as well, or no. no? No. Okay. Okay. So it's not available to U.S. residents. Um, the Cardano blockchain does not afford us details about the people that are delegating. So we're we don't we're not privy to any of that information. We don't do KYC on anybody doing the ISPO. Um, it isn't allowed by Americans because Americans are not allowed to invest in this kind of a thing. Um, but it's up to the people, up to people that are delegating for them to self-regulate themselves. It's not our responsibility. It's, it, this is a core function that is part of the Cardano blockchain. It's not, we haven't invented any kind of staking mechanic. We're just trying to use the architecture of the blockchain to its benefit and to create new types of business models on top of it. I see. Okay. You know, it's a, it's a very interesting term. You mentioned self-regulate. Um, mm. You know, the concern that I would have is just the U.S. residents who are participating in the ISPO, mm. you know, any type of potential recourse for them as it relates to any type of involvement later on down the road. Uh, should the mail token be considered an mm. unregistered security by the mm. SEC? I mean, I guess things like that would just be what kind of draw a bit of concern for me as far as being a U.S. resident myself and wanting to mm -hmm. participate in the ISPO. Uh, I mean, I guess, could you, could you speak to that? I mean, like, what do you foresee maybe just a, as like a worst case scenario? I mean, just hypothetically speaking. The question is more, I guess, a question to you because you're a longtime stake pool operator. Um, so if this is if this, if if there are if there's repercussions, then there would be repercussions for anybody staking in a stake pool outside of the United States with ADA. So, if an American has ever staked in a stake pool outside of the U.S., then they would be running into some of the same issues that they're running into now. Okay. Okay. What have you run into so, in the past? I mean, you well, you're an operator, so. Mm -hmm. As far as any type of legal issues, I mean, the ADA token isn't deemed as a security mm. by the SEC. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the thing with Cardano is also mm. that their ICO actually, it was in Japan. Right. Uh, you know, same thing, I guess, in your scenario, the ADA token wasn't available for sale to U.S. residents. Mm. 
Um, so, you know, anything like that, I mean, we mm. haven't necessarily run into any issues because yeah. as far as the tokens that we are awarding our delegators, mm. it's simply by the protocol as aid of rewards, mm. you know, we're not issuing any tokens Correct. that are also available for private sale. So I guess that's, that's kind of mm. where I'm just trying to understand better. Like how would somebody that's living in the United States want mm. to approach this ISPO, I guess is, is the question. Yeah. So in the case of uh, the MELD token, the MELD token is a utility. It is not a security. So that was part of our legal designation. Uh, so it meets all of the regulatory requirements for Singapore to not be a security. So I guess based on those terms, I mean, we do have uh, an American investor in our private sale. So we have the ability based on those criteria to have an American investor. But in regards to the ISPO, we don't recommend Americans doing it, uh, but we have no control over that. We don't, we're not uh, running KYC on it. We're using the infrastructure that uh, Cardano supplies. I see. Okay. All right. Well, that, uh, that definitely helps me better understand it. So I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I guess in order to you had mentioned 31 million, you know, in order to market this, you know, some, some things had to be done. So I kind of want to understand the process there. One thing that I had actually encountered on social media, I'm on Twitter quite a bit, uh, was, uh, you know, some bots. I noticed that there were some accounts that yeah. didn't really have any type of things like in terms of previous history that were talking about meld. Uh, so, you know, that, that kind of raised a few red flags. And I just wanted to ask you, like, what was the marketing strategy and were there bots used to promote bots were this used, ISPO? Absolutely. Bots were used. So what we found out, Rick actually sent and uh, sent me a telegram when he saw that. I think it was on like day three or something like that. I think it was a day after I did an interview with him. And he said, what is this? Um, and so then I reached out to a company that we're working with to do some of the marketing. So they do some of the graphics for the Twitter and they do some of the uh, telegram management. Um, and they had bought an ad package that included bots. So yes, there were bots. We saw that there were bots. We then talked to the marketing company and said, please stop it now. We didn't hire you to do any bots. You weren't supposed to do bots. They stopped it. But as we're seeing, this is something that keeps on coming back and keeps on coming back as some sort of touch point. Yes, there were bots. It was a mistake somebody made. People make mistakes. So it was stopped. Now everything is back to normal. Uh, but yes, that was the case. Okay. I, I got to give you kudos mm -hmm. for just acknowledging, you know, any type of obstacles that you've encountered. You know, it's a, mm -hmm. it, it does speak volumes as to the integrity of the team, at least from what I'm understanding. Uh, you know, of course, we all are trying to be vigilant within the space. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many things to look out for now. And, hey, you know, my I've role is part of several rug pulls as well. I get it. I yeah. totally get it. Yep. Yeah, you know, my role as an ambassador and doing what I do is just mm. to help educate the wider Cardano community. So I think that what you've done in coming out and being open about it, it does speak volumes. Uh, so I really do appreciate that. Um, now, just taking a look also at some of the other things that you've been working on, mm. you know, uh, the white paper, I did quite a bit of research to try and get up to speed. So now uh, you are also the CEO of Sekai Digital Twins and yes. a partner at uh, Octo Capital Group. Mm. Um, so I guess as far as the projects that you're working on, I guess, are these projects related to MELD? And will there be any potential hurdles you could see down the road in delivering MELD on time? Um, so yeah, so Sekai, I've been working on for about three years. Um, that's kind of where my technology background currently sits. So we're using AI and semantic technology to do uh, data ingestion, modeling, and building APIs for large infrastructure projects, asset intensive industries, things like that. Um, is there any sort of crossover between them? Not really. I mean, some of the stuff we do in regards to Sekai has to do with uh, large scale modeling of complex systems. So that might come into play in regards to MELD later on. Uh, Octo Capital. Octo Capital was a project that I started back in, I guess, 2017, when I I wrote a financial model for a new type of a bank, and I wasn't sure as to whether this model was was sort of functional or not, and so I went to a uh, a professor professor that specialized in this type of modeling in the UK. Um, 
he thought it was a really great idea and wanted to join the team and do some development there. Um, that has now been put to bed because working inside of the traditional finance world has loads of gatekeepers. And so when I saw the DeFi space and I saw that, you know, you had, you had, you know, 18 year old kids that were writing smart contracts to do perpetuals and they weren't asking permission from anybody. It just made so much more sense. So that's been put to bed and this has uh, meld has kind of come up out of the, out of that experience, not out of that business model. It was a completely different business model. So, um, Beyond that, it, uh, yeah, I mean, so those are the three projects, but I mean, I, I don't understand, I don't know if I got your question. Oh, it was mainly just to find out as far as if they were connected in any way and okay. if there well, is any connected. type of, yeah, like would there be any type of hindrance to the success of MELD based on if no, those the were opposite. being worked on? Okay. No, the opposite, because, you know, you could very easily jump into this kind of thing and assume that building a bank API is going to be easy. But I work with large industries. I work with Siemens and lots of big companies. Um, and I have worked with banks. They don't move quickly. They're very, very risk averse. They, you, need to, you need to pass through a lot of hurdles just to be able to get access. First conversation is going to be, what is your, you know, are you 27,001 compliant or are you 27,001 certified? You know, these kinds of issues, if I didn't have this background in industrial IT or enterprise IT, then I might make the mistake and assume that this process is going to be easy and I will sort of be overconfident and not plan for it to actually take as long as it's going to take and then fail. So a lot of my sort of background is draw or a lot of my experience is drawn from this background working you know with airbus and ge and these kinds of companies and understanding how they work how they behave how the technology functions um, and on one hand it helps me because i'm able to work closely with high and deal with a lot of the politics and on the other hand i'm able to avoid all of that really painful really slow movement and move super fast in the crypto space. So it helps on both sides. It's sort of, I'm alleviating it on one side and I'm able to, to not be overly confident on the other. Okay. Okay. You know, we touched on quite a few points here. So um, as far as the uh, token sale, the initial stake pool offering. So going back to that, I guess, um, hmm. as far as how the Cardano community can measure the success of the MELD project, hmm. uh, considering the amount of funds raised, I guess, what would you say are some goals, some milestones that you have for the project, uh, as far as being able to keep up with your timeline? I mean, you can, you can see our, you can see the timeline both on our webpage and in our docs. So right now, sometime in the summer, we're going to be launching the first version of our mobile app. And then we're hoping to launch in November with uh, crypto to crypto lending and wrapped assets. Uh, before that, we're actually tomorrow, we're announcing a really, really interesting new project um, towards the DeFi community that's not specific to Meld. It's more, more of a general product for the DeFi community. Um, and I think also tomorrow we're announcing a, uh, a piece of technology for being able to handle uh, security audits on uh, on Plutus smart contracts. Um, so we have a lot of things that are going to be launching uh, and announced over the next couple of weeks. Um, and then November is the big sort of launch of the protocol itself. And then at the beginning of next year, we will be able to start offering the fiat lending because the fiat lending is obviously going to take more time because you're dealing with banks. Yep. Yep. So I wanted to just touch on that as well. I mean, with the mm. protocol itself. So like being able to use meld, um, I guess, what does that actually look like? You know, let's say for instance, I'm a crypto holder. I've got some ADA, I've got some Bitcoin, but I don't want to sell my assets, right? I still mm. want to hold my crypto. So I guess as far as being able to put that crypto up as collateral, hmm. uh, I guess, what is the process there? I mean, is the person going to have to go through KYC or because it is meant specifically for banks? I mean, like, is hmm. the bank going to custody the crypto assets? Like, could you tell no, us no, a little no. bit about the non-custodial? Non-custodial. Okay. We're non-custodial. We're non-custodial. We're non-custodial. 
So this is the, this, I mean, if we weren't non-custodial, we would be no different than BlockFi or Nexo or Celsius. So the whole idea is to be non-custodial. The whole idea is you own your crypto, you own your keys. Um, I feel that the crypto space is mature enough to be able to do that kind of a thing at this point. And so the experience, the experience operates through a mobile app. So we'll have the Meld app, which will work on iOS, Android, and as an extension for the Chrome or Brave browser. Um, you'll use that. You'll create your own non-custodial wallet. You'll be able to bring in natively ETH, BNB, BTC. Um, you'll also be able to use those, and you'll be able to lock them up as collateral in the in the protocol and then you'll be able to borrow fiat against that we'll have several different types of loans um, the interest rate will be based on the risk oracle and the calculations the risk oracle does towards the current market conditions um, and the the experience is all operated exclusively through the mobile app when you borrow fiat you have to do kyc and the reason why you have to do KYC for borrowing fiat is that if we send a wire transfer of money to your bank account, your bank will not let you have that money unless you have the documentation for it, right? So this is anti-money laundering. And so we do the KYC because the smart contract then generates the necessary KYC ALM documents for your specific jurisdiction and then sends you the documents so that when your bank sort of reaches out to you and says, okay, you've just received $50,000 in your bank account. Where's your documentation for that? You can send them the documentation and then off you go. So where we will have KYC, but it's only for the fiat side, not for the crypto to crypto side. For the crypto to crypto side, we're no different than a, than a comp or an Aave or any of these other lending and borrowing liquid as an example. Sure, sure. So. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit also about, uh, so yield farming, I guess, uh, could you explain a little bit about that as well? So I'm not gonna go too much into the yield farming part. Um, we're still in Helm in regards to our liquidity pools or the meld vaults. Um, we're going to be producing a green paper on them. So we'll go into lots and lots of technical detail around them. All I can say is right now our inspiration is towards Bancor and Uniswap V3. So we're currently looking at single-sided LPs um, and we're looking at some sort of banded model with regards to the, uh, the bonding curves. Okay. Awesome. So it's a lot, it's a lot to take in, you know, there's a, <laughs> there's quite a bit of moving parts that you guys are thinking about. So, you know, as far as some of the questions that I had just about the ISPO, the token sale, how it actually works to be able to put up your crypto as collateral mm -hmm. to borrow fiat, you know, you definitely did touch on quite a, those, uh, quite a few of those points. So uh, thanks for helping to clarify that. Um, sure. I guess it's going to be really interesting to keep track of your progress. Um, you know, as far as the points that we had talked about today, Ken, uh, you know, thanks for coming on the show and speaking with us. Um, sure, and no problem. Where, uh, where would our audience be able to go to, I guess, learn more about the project and keep track of your progress? I mean, you can go to mel.com. We're constantly up updating that. Uh, from there, you can go to either our Discord uh, or you can go to our Telegram uh, communities and you can ask whatever kind of questions you want there. Um, it's manned 24 hours a day. We try our best, or I should say high tries his best to answer these questions in as accurate and lengthy uh, sort of detail as he possibly can so that there's as much information available as, as is possible. Um, so those would be the best places to, to find us and ask questions to us. Awesome. Okay. Very cool. Well, Ken, thank you again so much. I mean, we definitely sure. did touch on quite a few points and you did help to clarify some of those questions that I had. So I want to say thank you so much again for sure. taking the time. I really enjoyed the conversation and I uh, wish you the best with Mel. Likewise. Thanks for having me. I'll talk to you later. Thank you so much. All right. All take right. care. Bye.